Yes, it's Monday again, brand new week, and we are back again on the program, Issues of Today. Good afternoon and welcome to the program as announced. This afternoon, we are having a conversation with one of our own. Of course, if I want to count uh, his achievements, I'll take almost an hour in doing so. Um, well, he's known as uh, Ibrahim Mahama, uh, recently... Uh, when the train was coming from Takradi to Tamale, almost everybody was chasing it and taking videos and taking pictures. And you've heard about um, Red Clay Studio, which is located at Jena. Of course, he is the founder and also Nkrumah Volney. I'm yet to find out what Nkrumah Volney is from him. Of course, he is known for his large scale installations made from materials uh, with particular significance to Ghana's past and presence. Now, he is also known locally and internationally uh, through his artworks. Of course, he is known for transforming found objects, old, that, uh, old objects, rejected objects, I should say. He brings life to all those things and gives them true meaning and new meaning. Um, like I said, I cannot count a lot of his achievements and what he does. He is called Ibrahim Mahama, the son of Dagon and our own. My name is Jonas Biaurbi. Good afternoon and welcome to the show. Well, um, thank you for still staying with us here on the show. Uh, my guest this afternoon is Ibrahim Mama. He's an artist, the founder of uh, um, Red Clay Studios, SSC, SCCA, and Nkrumah Volney. Thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope I'm getting this SCCA right. Yes, it's the Savannah Center for Contemporary Art. Oh, yes. forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Afro Red Clay Studio yes. is very much in, yes. Uh, uh, popular. Yes, exactly. And then Nkrumah Volney, Volini, yes. also popular. Yes. But I still don't know what it means. Uh, so Nkrumah Volini is uh, the old silo at uh, Industrial New Anne. Okay. Uh, around the runabout, uh, next to Diamond FM. Oh, it okay. was uh, built in the 1960s mm -hmm. by Kwame Nkrumah. At the time, by he was working with these Eastern European architects, so Russians and all that. And the idea was to build a structure so they could store share nuts inside for export production and things like that. Mm -hmm. But in 1966, when Nkrumah was overthrown, all these projects were abandoned. Okay. And there were several of these buildings built all around the country. And people in Tamale were saying that oh, Nkrumah built it to detain his political opponent because of the architecture, because it was made of pure concrete. Okay. So in, during COVID period, the government was letting it go, and then I acquired it so that we could transform it into a public space. All right, that's good. For those who didn't know what Nkrumah Volney is, you just got the insight um, this afternoon. But um, before we go, um, can you briefly tell us who you are, Ibrahim Mahama? Because... You are all over the world. <laughs> so um, I'm from here, born in Tamale. Uh, my father is uh, Alaji Savannah, okay. uh, Savannah Constructions. Um, I was born here in 87. I predominantly grew up in Accra. So I think I was two years old when I, when I went to Accra. Oh, OK. Um, so um, I went to various schools there, ended up in Pope John Senior High did visual arts and then went to uh, KNUST to do my undergrad, my master's, PhD. But in 2014, I decided to move back to Tamale because I was getting really sick and tired of Accra, mm. too stuffy and like, there is so much work to be done here anyway. So and my father has always been one of the advocates for saying, if, you, if there is a chance to come back home and do something good, why not? So I decided to come back and then try to see what I could build here. And that's how come we're sitting here today. <laughs> okay, so there's one thing that uh, we've always been hiding. We don't mention it. He's also a doctor. 
It's a <laughs> PhD program. Yes. So he's Dr. Ibrahim Ama, not just Ibrahim Ama. Well, that one, I think I'll finish it this year sometime. <laughs> so I'm trying to finalize that. So okay, yeah. okay, okay. That's fine. So um, even before we go on with the interview, I have uh, this short video I want to play for the viewers. Then we continue with the interview. If, if the video is ready, play it for us. In the year 2020, a mind-blowing art space was inaugurated in the capital city of the northern region, Tamale. Ibrahim Mahama, the internationally known Ghanaian artist who was said to have used proceeds from the sale of his artwork to purchase six aeroplanes, extended the Savannah Center for Contemporary Art with the Red Clay Studio. Ibrahim Mahama is acclaimed for his large-scale installations and performances around the world. He is a collector of things, from jute sacks to sewing machines, train parts, smooth face grills, photographs, documents, and planes. He has recently been selected to represent Ghana at the Sydney and Venice. At the center are a collection of aeroplanes by Ibrahim Mahama, brought to Tamale by the road. They have transformed as discovery spaces and the seats will serve the various cinema rooms at the studio. What you're seeing in your shot right now is the aeroplanes which he has collected and is being shown at the center of the studio. We got the opportunity to enter one of the aeroplanes. The artist not only wants to create but also desires to transform the contemporary art scene in Ghana. In 2019, he founded the Savannah Center for contemporary art, bringing culture space to the local people. In the middle of the pandemic in 2020, the artist brought hope with the opening of a new space, Red Clay Studio, which you are seeing now on your screens. The space, named after the burnt amber earth of northern Ghana, is not only an artist studio. The idea is to connect communities with convertible rooms indoors and outdoors, allowing screenings, meetings, workshops, and creating. The aim of the cultural institution is to elevate minds by bringing a critical discourse through creation, communications, and diverse activities. This art piece is titled Food, and the artist used gari and other foodstuffs such as the dough used to prepare Chiozafe and Tom Brown plus feet. They are all mixed together to produce this material, very beautiful art piece that you can see.
Well, so um, that's some scenes from the Red Clay Studios. Uh, um, but as the conversation goes on, we'll show you once a while some uh, videos from the Red Clay Studio. So, um, uh, Mr. Ibrahim, now, what is the story? How did the journey begin? Why did you decide to go into art? Um, you know, when I was a child, I used to like drawing. So uh, my family really encouraged me to mm -hmm. do more of it. Secondary school was very crucial. When I went to high school, I remember those days. Um, it's at this, at now the days, parents are a bit more easier to convince that they, their children should do art. But back in those days, it was very difficult. Mm -hmm. But my father was extremely supportive. I remember when I was in secondary school, there were very few students in my program who knew the materials that I was working with. Mm -hmm. I used to buy these oil paints, gouache, mm -hmm. acrylic, and others. Whereas in secondary school, the curriculum only allows for you to use uh, postal colors. So yeah, even when the the subject around photography and all these things are very limited. So I got the chance through the support of my family to explore all these areas. So by the time I was completing secondary school, I was very confident that I could study art properly as a full course within the university. So that's where it all started from. And so you decided to go into it? Yeah, full time. Yeah, yeah but um, you know, when you mention artwork, uh, most people will um, be thinking it's just the painting, the yeah, drawing, drawing and <laughs> cut and paste, yeah. and then uh, doing design. But yeah. it's like your own has gone a different direction yes. where you use uh, old objects, transform them into. How? Tell us, what's the difference between the two? There is no difference, particularly, but it's just with the artist. What kind of artist do you want to be? Okay. Yeah, there are different types of artists in the world. There are some artists who just want to make paintings, drawings. But there are some artists also who want to reinterpret what a drawing or a painting is. Mm -hmm. Like the, for me, Clean UST was a very important aspect of my life, like going to Kumasi to the art school. And the art school in Kumasi was one of the premier art schools in the country. Um, and it's one of the most important art schools actually in the world with regards to the curriculum and what it teaches. You know, in most art schools around the world, like I travel around the world to teach, and most art schools are very conservative in the sense that every professor wants to be able to train his students to produce art as they know it to be. But there are some professors also who want to encourage their students to become new forms of like to new kinds of artists, you know. So in KNUST, there were professors who had been trained in the older regime, but when they became professors, they wanted to somehow open up the curriculum a lot more. So maybe you are you're coming from a family where your father is a, a blacksmith mm -hmm. or your father is a carpenter. But when you decide to become an artist, and, but maybe you've been helping your father, you see your father work, you know the craft, everything. But when you become an artist, they expect that, oh, you have to make paint a human being, draw. Mm -hmm. But maybe if you look towards the craft of your father or the family that you're coming from, there is something that you can learn from it that can actually expand the meaning of art in a way. And okay. that's what art is all about. Art is about freedom. The moment that freedom is lost, then it's no longer art, it's decoration. Oh. You might as well just paint a human being and hang it in your room and just look at it. But art constantly allows us to re-ask new questions. So when you come to red clay, uh, the artistic expression is not just the artworks that you see there, but it's the attitude, the building. Mm -hmm. Why did I have to shift my work from just making paintings into architecture, yeah. into building structures? into making boxes, into make, collecting archives, into bringing the trains, the airplanes. All those things are part of the artistic freedoms that I'm talking about. Okay. So, um, you know, what you have done at the Red Clay Studio is a lot of investment. Yes. And one will say that why invest your money into old uh, objects? Why go around buying uh, rejected, abandoned objects? Some would have loved to push their money into big time, big production yeah. companies. But you decided to go into um, uh, this uh, type of uh, business, I should say. Does it pay a lot? Well, it's not. It, with regards to Tamale, I didn't settle here because I wanted money. I think if I wanted to make money in my life, I wouldn't have come to Tamale. Okay. I always say that. Uh, not that I'm being disrespectful to the city, but come on, there is a lot of work to be done here. You know, especially when you're looking at things from a cultural perspective. So for me, I've always thought that my being here was more or less to contribute to the system and not to take from it. Um, I spend most of my time traveling around the world. Mm -hmm. I do work, I teach, I do exhibitions around. But if you look at art or culture generally, in other parts of the world, it's doing quite well with regards to diversity and all that. But here, when we talk about culture, all we are talking about is, oh, 
there is there's a fire festival that's coming or there is a, a damba or this but there's a lot more to culture than there is the everyday things that happen so coming from the intellectual background that i come from i thought that it would be more interesting to somehow invest whatever earnings that I earn through my work by teaching and others into this place to create different types of institutions that would somehow re-influence the culture of things. So what do you intend to achieve by picking old objects and bringing them to your studio? Well, they are not, you know, when something is old, it has a lot of memory in it. It's like old people, like old men. They always say that when an old man dies, what, it's an li entire library dies yeah. with them. It's the same with these objects, like these um, trains that I brought. Some of them, uh, like the object, they date back to the 1920s. Some of them were made in England. There are parts of it that were made in England in 18-something, which were brought to Ghana for the establishment of the railway. And you know, the railway was only built in the Gold Coast area, like um, uh, from Accra, Tema, the Ashanti region, Obwasi, Takwa, because the British built this mainly to extract commodities, gold, bauxite, and others. Post-independence, of, of course, and Nkrumah had the intent to expand it to the north, share butter production, things like that. But it never happened, you know? So people like my grandfather would have walked from Tamale all the way to the south. A lot of northerners who would end up going to Ejira, Mampong, others to go and farm. A lot of the produce that they would farm would end up in these trains. They will go off to the port and then they'll go to England. Mm. The issues of IMF, all those things are attached to all those things. So now, when these objects are abandoned, and I as an artist, like the government might say, oh, let's scrap them because they're obsolete. But they are not obsolete. There should have been a program where if anything, if we think anything is obsolete, at least the cultural ministry should be the first point of call to say that this thing, we no longer need it, but it has a very interesting history that we can preserve. So what do we do? There has to be a budget set aside for it. The cultural ministry intervenes. There have to, there, there have to be museums that are built for those things. When you travel abroad, there are common things. But here, when you talk about it, then it suddenly seems very strange. So, well, let's build a factory. How many factories have we built? And how many of them have collapsed? And how many factories have we built? And has it really changed the condition of the people here? That's the question. But maybe when you invest into culture, culture shifts the way children think, their attitude towards the environment and everything. One day, the kids who are experiencing all these objects, a lot of them will have aspirations, like when we take buses to bring them from the villages and all that. At the end of the day, you're introducing them to new ways of seeing life around the world. One of them might say, oh, one day I want to become an astronaut because of this. Meanwhile, maybe a lot of kids who are in rural areas and villages who their parents are farmers, they think, oh, when I grow up, I also become a farmer. I'll stay in this village. Very few people are able to escape it. But how do we create institutions that can somehow create new forms of aspiration among a growing generation? And for me, it is far more important than uh, any number of factories or businesses that you can invest your money into. So in short, you don't want us to forget about history through art? Yeah, but you know, the art is not necessarily uh, <laughs> the objects they say, it's the attitude around it. Okay. You know, so people always say, that, oh, but you're crazy, but why would you do this and that? But yeah. you realize that in the last couple of years alone, uh, SCCA, the number of exhibitions that we've organized, the number of kids in the city or around, who've experienced this and how it has somehow shifted their, uh, shifted their perspective is one thing. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of medical doctors, uh, engineers who bring their children to the institution f uh, on weekends, whatever, to learn how to draw or to learn drone tech, uh, coding, robotics, whatever. In another regime, that would have never happened because everyone thought that, oh, arts is, oh, the guys who are the art center or the guys who are by the roadside who are making the signboards and other things. But art, there is something deeply intellectual about it, you know. And at the end of the day, it's only left to us as uh, somehow the custodians of the practice in a way to contribute new forms to it that can expand the meaning. So beyond setting Red Clay as a tourist yeah. site for both local and international yeah. patrons, do you also paint to sell? No, no, no. It's, everything is free. Yeah, it's open. The, the reason why I built it here was because I thought it could make a contribution to the communities here. So we actually even spent our own monies to get buses, to, get, to take kids from schools and also rural communities to bring them there. The idea is to expand the meaning and definition of art. Yeah. Uh, you spend your own money? Yes. Uh, you picking buses yes. to bring students there yes. upon request or? No, 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 no. Like, uh, yeah, two days ago, there were a group of kids that came from. Yeah, Kwan. I think I saw them. I yes. was there. Yeah. yeah. So one of, there is an NGO there that does this uh, literacy program with them. They came and they talked to me about the literacy program we were doing. 
they wanted me to come there because sometimes we also go to the communities and then we do outreach programs we screen films we do presentations oh, okay. i show them some of the works that i do internationally so they will understand that oh you can come from here but you can also like be around the world in the future things like that and i said okay fine let's just organize a bus and let's go break them so we have some bus drivers that we work with in town vip others uh, and yeah we pay them a day like per bus i think normally now it's like 1200 or so oh yeah so tomorrow for instance there's a school around um where uh, what, I don't know whether it's Nansha or something. Yeah, we're taking two buses to bring. Sometimes the school, the, the numbers are overwhelming. 600 people, you can't bring all of them. Mm -hmm. So maybe mm -hmm. you concentrate, you bring 200 for now. Another day you time. take another school. Another week you go back and then, or oh, those who couldn't make it, uh, so little by little, things like that. So sometimes in a week, maybe you spend like maybe 10 to 15,000 just on buses going to pick students and bringing them there. The ultimate work is not just building the infrastructure. The ultimate work is the dissemination. It's not good enough just to say that, okay, now we built it in the north. Because growing up in Accra, I could have decided that, oh, why not build this in Accra? Or I spent most of my time abroad. I could have lived in New York or London or elsewhere, and I could have done this. And there you even get more support. Here is zero, you mm -hmm. see. So, but the work is that we, we see the kind of injustice. Because we from the north here, we are, like, uh, we are living in extreme poverty. Yeah. There's sometimes when you talk, people underestimate it, but... If you compare our, the situation to other people, you realize that we're really in, dire situ like in a dire situation. So the least that we can do is to find ways and means in which we can create institutions that can somehow rekindle hope among uh, a, gro uh, a growing population. Of course, within the older generation, I really don't tend to focus so much on them because when people are older, sometimes their minds are already made up. Yeah. But when kids are growing up, there's always a tendency that they are excited, they want to learn, they want to see things. Whatever they they're they also curious. They want to ask important. They ask questions, and sometimes in our part of the world, when kids ask questions, they like, "Oh, keep quiet to a child." But the more we shut them up, the more they become timid. That's why also within our political situation, when there's something going on, Ghanaians people will just keep quiet. Oh, uh, let me just keep to my business. But out there, when you go, people are very political. Like their voices matter, you know. But by building institutions like this, what you do is that you give voice to people to be able to ask questions. Because the kids, when they come there sometimes and you're talking to them and then you ask them a question, they're very quiet. They don't answer because mm. no one wants to get it wrong. Oh, okay. But the thing is that you never get anything wrong in the world. We're constantly learning. So once they come there and then they realize that they can fail, they can succeed, the world is open to you when you do it that way. Look at all the billionaires in the world. It's not like they just woke up one morning and they did something and they succeeded. They failed many times. And the more you fail, the more you learn something from it. So for me, the whole idea of the institution is to introduce something a lot more experimental, which can open up the way that the society functions and also thinks. Now, it's not something that brings profit to you. I mean, as in money. Yes. But you continue to spend in buying all these trains and old aircraft. How do you uh, refund your monies? Uh, well, I, as I said to you, I travel around the world. I teach. I, yeah, I t like next week, for instance, I'm going to So you work Europe. and you invest it yeah. inside. Yeah. So maybe in a year, like next week, I'm going to Europe uh, for a few days. Then I go to Bangladesh. Then I go to Dubai to teach. Then I go to India. Then I come back to Europe. I go to Brazil. So all those things that you do, like all the, the travels that you do, you travel here, you teach a bit, you do an exhibition here. All those things adds up little here and there. Outside the country, it might seem like an insignificant amount of money, but when you bring it down here, there's yeah. so much you can do with it. And I, for one, I'm not the type who is looking for. I'm, I'm not interested in being a rich man. You know, <laughs> you are really rich. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you know, the kind of uh, when people here talk about rich man, they're like they're they're always looking at how much money do you have in your bank account, things like. That. I really don't care about those. For me, it's more or less about the kind of wealth that we can create within the society. So if I have uh, 10 CD and I know that 8 CD can contribute something significant to the generation, after all, you are investing something not just for yourself, but for your children and your children's children. Mm -hmm. I always envy my great-grandchildren. I always say that, ah, they are going to be so wealthy. Because even with all the work that you are creating now, in, uh, even in five decades alone, in my old age, of course, by then they say, like, you wouldn't have any use for it. But in your children's children's time, that is when they will truly appreciate the significance of the investment that was made within the period that we're living in. So it means that 10 decades to come, you'll be a monument. 
Uh, well, it's left yeah. for the generation who will come to of decide. Of course, that. Uh, it's supposed yeah. to be so. We'll yeah. leave you at the red clay <laughs> yeah. and they'll come to see. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, so um, the red clay, does it have departments? Uh, not really, but we, the idea was to build a space that could allow for many different things to happen. So, for instance, uh, we have the original studio, which we have exhibitions in. We have the permanent collection of artworks that I've done, which are museums all around the world. So I decided to expand the studio so I could gift those artworks to the city and also to the country. So it means that you as a Ghanaian, you have a stake in every work that I've ever done, which is part of the collection here. Uh, we have archives railway to airplanes to uh, old factories like photographic there are also people in tamale who constantly come to us oh my family album blah 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 so we collect all those things and we preserve them oh, okay imagine so the, the, these type of institutions are important for the collection and preservation of memory we also have a library a new library we already have one at scca but we have a new library that we're going to open which lends itself to all kinds of things children's books whatever we have a photography lab that we're going to open and we also have two cinema halls that we're going to open. So I've been talking to some of the film guys here in the industry about how they could screen their films there and also allow for people to come together to watch films. You remember back then, they had a victory cinema and all these things. Yeah. Today, they are all shopping centers in Accra, Rex, and others. They are all now churches. Uh, but how do we preserve these things? Uh, it's very important. And um, we also have a greenhouse uh, for growing food, experimenting with food, things like that. We have an archaeological museum. Uh, so you know that in the north, there were there are a lot of archaeological objects here that were buried in the ground, mm -hmm. dating back to the last 2,000 years and more. A lot of them were taken, excavated and taken to Legon by the archaeology department. So I'm negotiating with them, collaborating. So we bring a lot of these archaeological objects back home. There is uh, an, uh, an older man here, Ben Saibu. He was a lawyer and an MP during Rawlings' time, I think in the West Mampusi district or something. And uh, I've been in conversation with him since 2019. It's been very, very inspiring. And he spent his whole life looking at these archaeological objects and things like that. So the idea is to somehow honor the, his life's work okay. through that and then also build a space that is dedicated to that. So the archaeological museum is there. And then we have the trains, the airplanes, which we use for classrooms and all kinds of things. In the future, we would have like um, uh, cafes uh, and all kinds of other spaces within the trains and all that. Some of the trains will actually be mobile. So I even brought the train lines, which we're going to build a railway line in Tamale here. Oh. And the train is going to move so your kids can come and sit in the train where they're having a workshop. But at the same time, the train is moving. I thought those uh, tra uh, trains are condemned. No. In my language <laughs> and in my world, there is nothing condemned. <laughs> I'm more, even one of the trains that I bought from the scrap dealers, they had cut it into scraps, into pieces. Oh. But I paid them to weld it back together again. So that's how serious I am about these things. For me, nothing is condemned. Even if it's pieces of paper that is torn, I'm, I'm, I'm rather more interested in how we piece it back together again. Yeah, so for me, history is very important, regardless of what form it comes in. The more important conversation is that are we as a generation really interested in the preservation of history through the objects that they come with? Is it that easy for you to get these objects? No, not at all. How difficult it is. Very it? difficult. It took 10 years to get the trains. 10 years. I was 25 when I started uh, chasing these trains. Wow. 10 years, yes. And I only recently got uh, some of them. I had to buy some from scrap dealers, and I also uh, got some through the Ministry for Railways. Yeah, so uh, it's back and forth. You know, sometimes someone has bought something, he's about to scrap it. But also because I do research, I travel around the country, I talk to people, my, I work with an uncle of mine, Uncle Lisa. He's very, very efficient. So, like, top negotiator. So, you have people that travel around. So, currently, he's in Takwa, even where we're trying to get some old, uh, like an old coach or something like that. Mm. So, he goes, he negotiates. He sees something that is interesting. He sends me a picture. I look at it. And I'm like, oh, this looks very fascinating. Uh, who owns it? Uh, this person. Or oh, he bought it through this and that. How much is it? Or oh, this. Oh, we can afford it. We can afford it. Oh, how can we negotiate? Yeah, we got it. We buy it. Then we organized the transport. The transport alone for the trains that we brought here was almost half a million, just for the trucks. Ooh. Yeah, because very expensive, because normally when scrap dealers buy things, they cut them into parts. So they, they are just interested in going to melt it, and they sell it to like Valk or whatever. But mm -hmm. we are interested in preserving it, so you have to be extremely careful how you take it apart and how you transport it. So all those things. And we spent, even we spent at least three days on the road. Wow. Because the trains are very heavy. Some of them are 50,000 kilos, 70,000 kilos. Takradi to Takradi. Yeah, through all the hills. Sometimes you're just going here, poof, tie, three ties are bust. 
And you have to stop you have and to fix stop. it again. Yes, you have to fix it. Sometimes you sleep by the side of the road. It really the cost you. Yeah, but at the end of the day, for me, it's the work that needs to be done. Beyond that, nothing really matters. So sometimes you're on the road for one week, you've not taken a shower, just to transport an object somewhere. But for me, I know how significant it is. At the end of the day, I'm not there to impress anyone. I'm there to do the one work that I think that God has somehow directed me to do. Yeah, I'm yeah. not a very spiritual person, but I think that some of these things are very important. It's another form of spirituality in a way that you dedicate your life to something, just one thing. Like, I think as a country, we could have learned that. Uh, there are many people who somehow just live and nothing seems important to them. But if you all just took one thing, like, oh, this thing, I'll spend my entire life just doing this one particular thing. Imagine in uh, 20 years how well the country is going to change. Wow. Yeah. The last time I ever heard you say some of these materials you have at the red clay, sometimes you have to go and have that connection with security men, cleaners. Yes. When they are about <laughs> taking it to throw away, then yes. you pick it from them. Exactly. That's serious. No, exactly. Like some of the factories in Tema that they were demolishing, some of them from Gihok and others, they, were, they would literally just bring out the files. They would burn everything. Oh. Yeah. You remember, like, sometimes I think I was born too late. I wish I had born, like, 50 years ago. Because in <laughs> Ghana, before I was born, a lot of things were scrapped. Imagine, Ghana, like, the trains I have here, they are modern trains, mm. diesel trains, but we had the steam engines. And, you know, the Industrial Revolution that contributed to a shift in the way technology span came from the Industrial Revolution, uh, uh, came from the invention of the steam engine. Trains were born and all these kinds of things. All these things were destroyed. The only memory we have of the steam engines is currently a light from one of the trains from 18-something that I managed to secure from second that is mm -hmm. at Red Clay. Yes, that's the only thing that exists. So imagine, let's say, 30, 40 years ago, there was someone like me who was very active and was doing this kind yeah. of work. Imagine the kind of things that we could have, the memory we could have saved from that era. I know very well that we would have even have the, that smoke in Kruma war to say Ghana is free for us. <laughs> <laughs> As for that smoke, I think it's at the National Museum. We could lo lo take it on a loan any day and bring it here. Oh, okay. Yeah, so okay. it's, if we don't have institutions like this, then you have no claim to do some things. You can't just go to the museum and say, oh, give me the smoke of Nkrumah. Mm -hmm. But if you invest into building an institution like this, then you can say that, hey, look, uh, we want to actually share this history with uh, a younger population in this part of the country. So, yes, you have the facility, blah, blah, blah. We bring it. It's a collaboration. We do it. And it can travel. But it needs, we need to be able to build many of these type of institutions around the country. Okay, if you, um play for us that video, the, um, the shoemaker boxes, you enter one of the, <laughs> the rooms, you see how they pack them there. Uh, you play, let's see, and ask him what it means the, if you have that video, the uh, shoemaker boxes. In fact, well, this, the, okay, yes. Let's go back to the, 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 the boxes, the, the boxes. We are going to take it one after the other and ask him so he can explain to us. Yes, this one. Um, so, um, well, so what you are seeing on your screen, uh, I mean, uh, shoemaker boxes. If you know what a shoemaker uh, is, uh, that box that they hold and knocking it, pang, 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 say shoemaker. Yes, that's what you are seeing over there. What uh, uh, does this mean? Um, well, this was a work, an artwork that I produced in two th between 2013 and 2017, when I was, uh, I was think at the time I was doing my masters, and I was at the time, of course, I was going to the railway, looking at they were, had already started scrapping some trains, modern trains, and all that. And you know, when they scrap the train, the floor, when you see the trains at Red Clay, the floor, mm. which is damaged, mm. it's made of wood and okay. uh, a certain type of leather. So I was collecting all those materials. And I would go to Tema. There's a lot of the factories that were abandoned. I talked to security men, I'll get the interior of the factories, wood, furniture, all kinds of other things. And then we use those factories as production sites because I was already collecting the boxes. Because the boxes reminded me of tiny homes. And you know, it's a paradox. A lot of these guys who go around with the boxes, mm. when they come to the city from Kumasi, uh, Jura, uh, or like yeah. other places, they pick objects wooden parts and they make these objects from it where they fill it with the uh, shoemaking tools mm. you go around every morning pack, pack, pack. but when they hit it so much holes begin to appear in it and oh, they begin okay. to patch them over time so i was very fascinated by their character aesthetics so i started collecting them 
and I was making photographs with that with them, the boxes in relation to the the kais when they come for Wale Wale and other places and they go to Accra, mm. they mostly write their family names on the, uh, and their body okay, and the tattoo. Okay, and those okay. tattoos are connected to even our own history. How when people would move from here to Accra historically and then they felt that if they died on their way, how would their bodies be identified, things like that. So I thought that the body was somehow connected to the box in a way. In art, the, idea, the point is always to establish the connection that no one would think about. Mm -hmm. So at some point, I've been, I'd been invited to Ukraine to do this uh, big exhibition. So I decided to expand the exhibition. So I started collecting uh, the boxes. I started collecting all kinds of objects and putting them together from uh, things that are used to smoke fish along the coast. Mm -hmm. uh, women will store fishes in their crates, canoes that have been abandoned that I'll buy and then we'll make them into boxes, uh, the old train parts, all kinds of things. So now when you look at the shoemaker box, the shoemaker box is not just a simple shoemaker box that you know. It now combines all kinds of different environments and yeah. spaces into one. Okay. Uh -huh. So when okay. you look at the shoemaker box, it's not just, oh, just some pieces yeah, of so, wood. Yeah. So this, this is a community. Exactly. It's a community. It's like an entire, it's like the entire world put together. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. All kinds of objects coming from other places. Yeah. So uh, what we are seeing right now, apart from the shoemaker box, there are some other uh, smaller, smaller things that are packed yeah. in it. There are bags. You know, they should make sometimes they put things in some of the bags. Mm. And I also want to introduce elements that kids can associate with. Sometimes when you go to the market, the kids are with their parents and are going to buy bags. They like to get a Batman bag because it's in fashion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And sometimes the shoemakers also use it. You can see the yellow yellows. Mm. Sometimes they hang funny things at the back of the yellow mm -hmm, yellow, mm -hmm. like a, a, a monkey, like a crucified yes, monkey, yes, things yes. like that. So those things are iconographies that you can also introduce into the work. So when people see it, already at the back of their minds, it's something that he might have been familiar with. But when he sees it within that context, the next time he sees it, he doesn't just think that it's absolute rubbish. It's like, ah, I saw this thing in a museum. He begins to reflect upon it. Art really need critical thinking. Exactly. Yeah. And for, let's see the Spanish. I mean, there are a lot of Spanish hand over there. Let's see those who are saying, <laughs> the Spanish and, and find out from him. Yes, look at it. Yeah, um, those uh, with shoe, uh, red, this red shoe and bag, uh, yeah. and, and, and even hammer, right? Yeah. If we go, go back to the Spanish. Yeah. Le, let's see. Yeah. The red shoe, I bought it here in Tamale. There's a woman just next to the ADB bank who sells uh, shoes. Oh, okay. So I was just walking by and I saw this red shoe. And it was, I was like, oh, this is very beautiful. It will fit really here. And the Spanish. And the Spanish, and it came from an old uh, shop in Accra okay. where they were selling Spanish and all that. And they were throwing it away. So I bought it and then I added it to it. Everything is important. Hey, yes. When they are throwing away, you are buying. Yeah, I'm collecting it because of the significance of the aesthetics that it comes with. Some of them, termites have eaten parts of it. It's almost fading away, but there's still the image attached to it. And that's what art does. It allows us to look at things again when no one would look at it. Mm. When they say, let's destroy, art says, wait, let's look at it again. What possible vision can this offer us, even when it's at a point of oblivion? Okay, so uh, should I say this is a carpentry shop? Because I see a uh, uh, saw blade. I see shoe yes. and I see... Yeah, they were selling these things, you know, they are selling... Carpentry. When you go to the shops in town, where they are selling hammers and all that, they paint, they do all kinds of interesting things, and then they hang them. But one day they will say, it's not interesting, let's throw it away. Whereas the artist might say, oh, this is interesting, because in maybe 100 years to come, this might not exist anymore. We might be living in a different technologically advanced age where okay. you don't even need to go to the shop. Like now, you can just be in your home and order for things. But once we begin to combine these objects, this now becomes a cultural phenomenon. It becomes part of the collection of the state. So in a hundred years' time, it's still part of our culture. Kids who are growing up now, they will grow up knowing it. They will take their children to see their children. That's how culture is produced. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Efo, there are some Zana mats over there. Um, let's see them. Because um, most of them, when you go to the villages, especially yeah. the Fulani communities, you see them use them. Yeah. But these ones... What does it mean? Ah, Dekbala. Uh, recently, we just, uh, it was just a few days ago. You know, this space is called the Parliament of Ghosts. Okay. And the Parliament of Ghosts was a work I made originally for a museum in Manchester. Yeah. Um, and the idea was to build a parliamentary body which was addressing the Brexit crisis at the time. And, you know, uh, English were saying that, oh, we have to leave the European Union because people are coming in to take our jobs. But I'm like, guys, let's remember uh, all those hundreds of years ago, how you went around the world and how you exploited, blah, blah, blah. So I took objects that the British had brought here to build a railway. 
that they were at the railway station they were throwing away, I put them together and then I took them back to England and I made a parliamentary form out of it in relation to the parliamentary body in, the, the, like the, in, in Westminster. So it was very interesting. And when I came back to Ghana, I decided why not build a parliament as an architectural form. So in the parliament of Ghost, all kinds of things exist there. Mm. It's not just supposed to be a parliament where human beings come together to talk, but it's supposed to be a place where objects which are neglected and abandoned, which are things that are left for dead, I collect them in a nice stage, almost as if, you know, when the, you look at the image of parliament where people sit around, mm. yeah, so we always bring objects oh, there. Okay. So the Gbala, they use it for buildings, like yes. sometimes they use it for the roofs, things like that. But this time around, I imagine them as characters, having conversations mm. among themselves. So I commissioned those who are making it around the villages to produce, let's say, 400 of those. Characters conversing? Yeah. How? Yeah, but this is grass which is dead. <laughs> dead grass. And then, but at the same time, that's what historically our ancestors were using to build their homes, silos, whatever. So mm. it, might, it might seem dead, but it's still very useful. It provides us shelter, things like that. And also when you're going into a home historically, that was the first thing that you encountered, the first point of contact. So for me, I think that there is a certain memory in relation to, let's say, even the conditions of living, particularly in relation to the space that we find ourselves in. Oh, okay. In. So when you enter that room where you have this thing, you see that some are on the top, yes. some are those on the ground too, some are down, some are a bit yes. higher. You can walk in between them. So art is not just something you see on a wall. Oh, this is a beautiful painting. No, but sometimes you are also immersed within it. You have to go inside of it. You get lost within it. It's an experience. And also the idea is not just to produce art that people are familiar with. If not, it's not art at all. The idea is always to produce things that when people see, they pause and say, hey, I didn't know this thing too could be art. Oh, but what is special about it? Then a, a conversation begins to ensue. For me, that is the most important thing. How do we create things that allow us to have new conversations? That's okay. So um, he is um, Ibrahim Mahama. This name is very popular. Everybody says Ibrahim Mahama. Today, he is in the studios here of ZAR TV, live on issues of today. We're taking a short breather in some uh, 30 seconds. When we return, the conversation continues. Stay with us. Thank you for still staying with us here on Issues of Today here on ZAR TV. We're still having a conversation with uh, Ibrahim Mahama, soon to be Dr. Ibrahim Mahama, uh, the founder of uh, Nkrumah Volney, Red Clay Studio, and Savannah. I don't get it well. Savannah Center for Contemporary Art. Savannah Center for Contemporary Art. Now, um, I wanted them to play that video, but I didn't yes. get it. Uh, in a video where I have somebody uh, have a lot of uh, whether is it tattoo That's or what written yeah. on it yeah. and all those ones you are um, I mean exhibiting them for what 
Uh, those are somehow biodatas, you know. <clears throat> I was telling you that my grandfather, his generation, they made these long trips to Accra for greener mm -hmm. pastures. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Nkrumah's plan was always to somehow eradicate the condition and the poverty that was here. Mm -hmm. You know, even during the Anglo-Ashanti war, a lot of northerners went down south to fight with the Ashantis and all that. Uh, fight with the Asha, uh, 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 for the Ashantis uh, uh, against the British and all that. Of course, years later, to these days when you're talking about the North, people always still have a very percept like a certain weird perception of the North. Oh, isn't that the Srim for the Bush people? Things like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Even I remember, like back home in Accra, like your friends, when you say like, oh. I'm going to the north. Do you want to come with me? They're like, oh, but I hear you take five days on a journey, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I hear when you get there, the sun will scotch you immediately. <laughs> and my color too wasn't convincing them. So <laughs> things like that. So I, I always said, ah, but why? Like, uh, you also see the Kaya's. And predominantly when children who are growing up in Accra who see the Kaya's, the image of the north doesn't really change much. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think that was one of the biggest disappointments in the current government when the vice president came. Uh, I thought that one of the most important things would have been somehow to invest into a certain infrastructure that would have eradicated that problem. Because I remember back some time ago, they spoke about ideas of uh, building hostels in the south which would accommodate the, um, the Kaya yes. years. But we're not interested in accommodating the Kaya years in Accra. We're interested in eradicating the problem. You know, and these kaiyis are the kaiyis that you see the photograph of their hands because a lot of them they are born in villages or in communities where there are no clinics, no hospitals. A lot of them they are born, they don't even know there are no dates of birth, there are no birth certificates. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them no IDs. Of course, now we have the Ghana card and all these things, but systematically for a long time the condition of the people here were like that. You know, and you can't deny that uh, there's extreme poverty in this part of the world. You know, of course there are so many NGOs here, but it doesn't really change the condition. So for me, I was very much interested in that in relation to the objects that I collect. So for instance, if I collect uh, the trains, which is at, uh, attached to, let's say, the exploitation of mineral resources from the country, and then you somehow make a juxtaposition between that and, let's say, the body of a kai, which has, let's say, biodata written on their hand. Because till now, people shouldn't be practicing these things anymore. If you travel, even if you have a, an identification card, they still write their names on their body because if I die in transit or something happens to me, that body is the way that maybe my relatives could be identified. They write maybe the town they came from, their father's name, their grandfather's name. So it's a way of tracing the lineage mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the ancestry. So for me, I always thought that it was important to somehow make a juxtaposition between that and the everyday objects that we use, like the boxes of the kaye and many other things that normally would see them apart. But for me, I, as an artist, I think that it's very important that we somehow recreate images that somehow allow us to really look at things, the conditions within our society. If not, we keep, we keep deceiving ourselves. Oh, we're doing well, we're doing this and that. No, but the condition is that we are still living in dire, like a really dire situation. So uh, art is not really meant to solve the situation, but it's really meant to ask really important questions. How far have we come? How do we see ourselves? Where are we heading to? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, things like that. Do you intend to partner with government in any day to um, manage the Red Clay Studio and even make it bigger than it is right now? No, not at all. The, the idea is not, uh, we are not really looking at uh, uh, working with government in that sense. Sometimes something can be done privately, but it's public. Like, for instance, when I bought the Chroma Volini, it was state-owned and I bought it privately, but I made it public and accessible before no one could go there. You know, it was a death trap. Mm. So it's not, I think that's why sometimes the government also says that they have to empower private or like individuals in order to be able to do things. There are limitations to things that you can do when you're working with the government. Of course, the trains, I also got some of them from the government where the railway ministry was very interested in that. So we, through collaborations and all that. So there are aspects or strategies that you can use to get things done. But with regards to uh, working with the state in order to do some things, there's a lot of limitations to it. And my work, it starts from no limitation. I'm already, when I want to do something, I just go ahead and I do it. And I try to be as economical as possible whilst trying to maximize efficiency with regards to what they can do. But sometimes, you, we've all seen it. Some of the figures you see online, oh, we spent 10 million in doing this. And you, I'm like, but you could have spent 100,000 to do this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so these kinds of things. The idea is to somehow maintain 
a certain sense of independence in it. And it's also important for young people to realize that independently, they can do things that can also contribute to the development of their country. Yeah, there is not a, the government always, doesn't always have to do everything. I think the government also has to encourage people, particularly young people, invest into what they do privately and quietly so that when those things expand, it can also inspire more people to want to stay in their own country, in their own town, their own village, or wherever, to contribute. That will stop the number of people who decide to migrate from, uh, let's say, the north to the south for the greener pastures and things like that. One of the airplanes at the Red Clay has been converted into a classroom. Yes. And uh, as a Saturday when I went there, there were students yeah. learning with an instructor. Yeah. What exactly are you teaching them over there? Well, the, we have one of our very good friends, Madi. He was very interested in when we came, when we brought the planes, and also we we're doing these drone tech classes in the beginning. And he himself, uh, he's very savvy in like tech and all that. And he proposed to us to create one of the classrooms permanently within one of the class, uh, airplanes. So we do coding. We bought these system units where you can take them apart yeah. to the microchip. So the kids actually understand how it like how a computer is built and what it is. Oh, okay. So we can dismantle it to the very the simplest unit and we can reassemble it. And also we can teach them how the system code and everything works. So there are a couple of schools where we've, um, we've written letters to their parents, to the schools. We have the permits and everything. So Saturday and Sunday, I think twice a week, uh, we, we have a bus that we take. We, they, they converge at a point. We take them there. We do the classes in the airplane. And afterwards, we take them back home. Um, there are also other schools that come there and then maybe periodically we do things. There are also some parents, like there's a woman who always brings two of her kids on a motorbike every weekend and then they come there and then they, they learn how, to, how the drone technology works, blah, blah, blah. But I was surprised, recently I saw the kids, they, 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 they are kid, like her kids are so well <clears throat> trained now in it that when other kids come, now her kids are the ones who are somehow teaching them. Oh, okay. uh, even as young as they are. So, um, yeah, they, they, there is something really inspiring about it because once you find yourself, because imagine you're coming from a place like this, you never saw a plane. Of mm. course, everyone can see a plane from the sky. Uh, you see a plane there in the landscape, the same landscape that the shared trees and everything the farm is in. You enter, there's a classroom in it, you learn coding. The inspiration that you get from it or the excitement is not the same thing as sitting in a classroom block. No, we need classroom blocks, but also some of these things, they are, it inspires certain imaginations and certain motivations. So the classes is open to all students? Everyone. It's completely free. Also, as I said, every, every program of ours is completely free. And uh, if you're interested, you just have to sign up, call us and sign up with us, and then you have access to it. That's great. Um, I think uh, it's, it's a good initiative. It offered me the opportunity to actually see the inside of an airplane. Oh. <laughs> Big yeah, yeah. I, in fact, uh, on Saturday when I was there, <laughs> yes. and I entered where the students okay. were, and yeah, that was my first time to have a feel of the inside of an airplane. So at least um, we all. You mean the cockpit or the fuselage, the inside itself? The inside itself. Oh, interesting. Yes. Yeah. So we all say thank you to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, so um, uh, you are from here. Yes. You speak Dagbani. Yes. But you didn't grow up here. Yes. You speak perfectly? Yes, yes, I speak. Well, so I'm giving you five minutes to speak. This one is your camera. Hey, this one, the pressure. <laughs> this is your camera. Speak to the whole of North, <laughs> the whole of Dagbon. What exactly you do at Red Clay, inspire the youth, um, why they should also venture into art. This is your camera. In Dagbani. In Dagbani. Where you? <laughs> Uh, so, maybe it's a pair. It's a facility shelter, it's only red clay. Red clay, man, you're like an artist. It's an abandoned drawing, man, I'm painting, man. But, uh, and Kananda, man, the deep color drawing, I'm painting, Katananda. Art, man, the mala, different, 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 different types, in departments. So, I'm going to draw a drawing, so I'm going to draw a drawing, maybe. So, Manila B School, National like here in UST, no man can an undergraduate, in master's, and a PhD, so in that bomb in Europe and Marche, because I'm Yulichi, I'm Fanny Shambilla, the Puni, Titi Bay, 
in maybe be and one be yar shanga then to end up good that we come up into our society shall be the pool mom and be yar so tamala come on exhibition spaces artists shaba dada artists shaba dano artworks ka be a shaban zoro mama binji lab in yarma but to kana na man tini la artworks maza to me tamala airplanes kura shedding ada la airplanes ma the malade mama how do we say history in the bani Eh, history. Pakali, history in Dagbani is what. Yalukura. Yalukura. You see that you are a trouble. Ah, Yalukura. Ah, so la be armaza ma. Be ma anichi alu play ma pune. Kabuchana butu bu ambre. The way shall maybe be a shambi and bu amne mane excitement shall be and be bu pune. The ben nong kama maybe na bimbi classroom pune classroom blocks maybe yar. Time time la trains kura. Train ma, the you a pump champion come out eighteen something Zaka with our toll train is Zilliji and Zilliji, and so Zilliji Nema. But so no, I will as okay is under Zilliji Kura Kanachi. But Zilliji Maka did it pull up maybe the Sam maybe even shall. But shall maybe maybe the Sam, no addition, Ama, but I'm Alaman scraps. And tea a bishop that cannot dead and one. Can that barber, but I am Savuluplo. Can that barber. So when you ask me, you know, my bully bala. Can we have scraps? Can I get scraps from Brazil, Jim bala? But I just need Brazil, Jim. So when the angel mag, but I have a bunch of Brazil, Jim bala. Aha. So when you ask me, I have been making my. This is the answer when I know of Wama because it's in between. So when you ask me, I have been making my South Polo. I have a Kanache. So I have been making my South Polo. I have been making my South Polo. So at the end of the day, I have been making my South Polo. So at the end of the day, I have been making my South Polo. So at the end of the day, I have been making my South Polo. So at the end of the day, I have been making my South Polo. The relationship with history, ma'am, and being here. So, being here, ma'am, and then let me in such way that maybe be sure, ma'am, zoro na da shell. Be zara na to bank, ma'am. Maybe anje na north, ma'am. The di palak, ma'am. Maybe wa ala shell tin be wa pu, ma'am. Di pu na kati yang palam. Agba na to yina che. Kaba agba to zoro na da shell and to make a contribution. Anto na being here shadi and live ge situation be here to ashan tin be repu ne north, ma'am, polo. So. Long kunyale to pull your kapai. Well, so you see, your son grew up in Accra, been travelling all across the country. So that's it. But he has still done. They should really congratulate me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you you have done very well, very well. Just that um, train is Zeriji, airplane is Alaplane. Alaplane. Okay, so um, I think our time is up, but the conversation is getting more interesting and interesting. Uh, we'll find time again, yeah. even though you are not stable. Yeah. Uh, we'll find more time, come film the whole place yeah. and um, get more yeah. explanations and come and educate our people yeah. and uh, everybody across the country. So um, your final words to the youth. Um, well, I think that... Um one of the things that young people have to realize is that the reason why we are young is because we, are, we can fail. Uh -huh, you see, we have to try things again and again and again. And genuinely, I think every young person should ask themselves one question. What contribution can I make to my society? Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be big. Sometimes they are very small things. Like the NGO that recently I encountered from Kwane. Very, it's a very small community uh, organization. But with the impact that they have within their community is very strong. I always see that in Tamale, I always say that one of the things that really annoys me is the shishe. Like when I see so many young people at night oh, who are the very yeah, 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 the, yeah, yeah. Like there is so much like <laughs> yes. base. Base, base. There's so much work that you can yeah. do, like you can you can spend more time to train your intellect, but just sitting around, just talking. Oh. Yeah. And picking all forms of habits. So for me, I think that it's really important that as young people realize that in every society, they always say that the future, as young people, we're all the future. Yeah, so we really have to reflect upon that. And we really have to ask ourselves, what kind of society do we want our children to grow up in? All right, I wanted us to end here, but I need something from yeah. you. In um, one minute, if you were asked to advise the government, um, uh, like you are suggesting that they should put up initiatives that will eradicate KIA, yeah. what would you advise them to do that could eradicate KIA? Well, I think that one of the things that the current government already did was the free secondary school education. But of course, it needs a lot more. The implementation needs to be improved. 
uh, but also investment within, let's say, the agri sector in the north is very important. A lot of the women who come from here, who go to the south, not, of course, look, um, I'm not uh, naive. It's not everyone that will end up going to school and will do a white collar job. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are some people who also work in industries. When you go to Germany and other places, there's a lot of investment in skill and industry. And a lot of the people who go to the south to go and do kais, shoemaker and all that, they can actually live in the places where they come from and they can make meaningful contributions there in the field of agriculture, industry and many other things. So I think that it's one of the most important things that we have to do here in the north. We really, the government really has to invest a lot into the infrastructure of, let's say, industry and all that. Of, aside the education, of course. All right. Um, thank you so much for um, agreeing to yes. speak to us this afternoon. Um, he's Ibrahim Mahama. I love this doctor, but he's still on the way. <laughs> Dr. Ibrahim Mahama. Um, he is the founder of Red Clay Studio at Jena, Nkrumah Volni at uh, uh, is this Nyuani, and also um, the Savannah Center for Contemporary Art is at full. He owns all these three sites that you can always visit. Yes, to I mean things that you don't know. You get history over there for free. For free. Um, for free. For free. Uh, because you know we get up here, we go to Moli, Kakum National Park, and all those places, and we pay. Now it's just here for us at our doorsteps. Go to Jenna and explore yourself. My name is Jonas Biaurubi. We thank you so much for spending your one hour with us this afternoon. We'll be back again on Wednesday on the program with a different guest. Bye for now.